Hello and welcome everyone to a very special but short episode of the Gamers of the Station podcast. I am joined today by two of my lovely dear friends, Aston and Sam. Why don't you guys introduce yourselves? Hello, I'm Aston. Uh, I'm one of Jonah's friends, one of his many, many friends indeed. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really great to be here, you know? <laughs> yeah, so I'm Sam and again, one of Jonah's many, many friends. We go way back and yeah it's a pleasure to be on the show today all right no worries so today's podcast is a very special one for you boys as i'll be discussing model panics in the media in regards to my bcm 110 digital artifact which i am pretty excited for and yes i'm well aware you boys do not know anything about this podcast I know nothing about it. (laughs) As I should say, yeah. (laughs) So yes, there is a specific reason for you audience members listening why I have these lovely human beings on the podcast today is because all three of us are very passionate gamers that have in some capacity consumed media through video games. You know, let's start off by briefly explaining to the audiences your experiences with video games. So we'll start off with Sam and then we'll go to Aston. So I guess, Sam, just, you know, just I'll elaborate to the audience your experiences with uh, video games. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I think I can speak for everyone when I say that video games were a big part of our childhood growing up. I mean, you know, I, I think I had a Nintendo DS back when I was five or six years old in kindergarten and, you know, I've seen from that time go from small handheld games like a DS um, and, you know, the first ever console that we got was a Wii back in 2012 or whatever it was. Um, you know, I've seen the evolution in that time from the PlayStation 3 all the way up until the current console at the moment, which I'm very fortunate enough to have, but the PlayStation 5. Yeah, kind of like Sam, like I've always been, video games have always been around me when I've been growing up. Like I first was exposed to it on the Wii when I played Wii Sports. That was like, that pretty much changed my life essentially when it comes to playing video games ever since. Like starting off as like something that I just play with friends to like playing like massive like single player games with elaborate stories and things to do yeah it's just like something i've always always played yeah yeah right yeah no worries yeah firstly can you know can one of you tell me what you know understand about moral panics based on what you've heard or understood from the media uh look my brief understanding of a moral panic not of like the definition of moral panic as Mm -hmm. such but COVID-19 first became a real issue in today's society and everyone was pushing for the vaccine and the government mandated that a you know yeah. double vaccine to be let out and everything like that. Um, it sent everyone into a bit of a moral panic where they're like, oh, you know, this is unethical. This goes against everything that I believe in. I shouldn't be mm-hmm. forced to do it. Yeah. Um, you know, this can cause problems and everything like that. Yet we still have a 99.5% yeah, double no vaccination worries. rate in Australia. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, so essentially there's this uh, famous South African criminologist named Stanley Cohen who is regarded as possibly one of the main experts in regards to moral panics, and he describes the term as a condition, episode, person, or group of persons emerges to become defined as a threat to social values and interests. Its nature is presented in a stylized and stereotypical fashion by the mass media, as was published in his book in 1972. Now, to what extent would you agree or disagree with Cohen's definition of moral panics? Well, I think he it sounds like he's got it pretty bang on the head, in my opinion. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, like I, yeah, it's just like, the, especially the idea of like how the media can exaggerate some very key things. Like I know, like with panic, things are not always fully communicated properly and media just like loves things that aren't taken so literally but to dramatize things yeah yeah exactly you would think because the book was published in 1972 that it would stray from our relevancy i know a lot of academics reference stanley cohen and especially his definition as well which i think really plays into uh our understanding so yeah i will go straight into we'll just take you know quick breather and we'll just go straight into part two afterwards all right we are back i'll start off by asking how often do you guys partake in any particular form of gaming 
Look, I mean, I, a game, but it, it, it'd it be mm-hmm. on a rare occasion just with uni and work and everything. It's probably about yeah, yeah. once a month or something. Yeah, just on and off game. And I know, Aston, you'd be the same as well. Oh, uh, I'd, I'd probably say I play games a fair bit now because of work, essentially. My afternoons mm-hmm. and weekends are free to play lots of yeah, games. Yeah. So would you say that between both of you guys, you more play calm, kind of like less violent video games or more violent video games? Mm, I'd say that I've got a fairly good balance. Like, I mean, Mario Kart is a pretty not a super violent game it's very cartoonish and then but la noir is like the other end it's like graphic criminal investigations shootings Mm -hmm. murders it's very graphic i guess yeah right so yeah um in relation to violence in video games it's always important to look at what academics say about the issue you know rather than looking to the general media and here i have two quotes from academics both of the articles also for reference uh i'm about to discuss will be included in my reference list so the first one is when players continually make decisions and control the characters it increases the self-relevance of events in the mediated world and if we go to our second quote first playing violent video games may directly affect children's propensity for violence Second, when children play violent video games, they forego other activities. These activities may provoke violence to a larger extent than violent video game playing. Thirdly, children who are attracted to violent video games are a selected group of children likely to engage in such violence, promoting activities as loitering and drinking, which gets substituted by video game playing. In regards to both of those, to what extent do you agree with these academics? And how might media react to moral panic of video games causing violence? Yeah, I, I think that's a pretty standard definition of it. I mean, working at a game shop myself, in the younger demographic that are coming in and starting to ask for more violent games that are rated, you know, M, MA15+, R18, and they're 6, 7, 8, 9 years old and are getting these games bought for them. I think is just absolutely outrageous, you know, it's going to lead to more problems later on. Yes, obviously, they they may not be violent, but playing violent video games that aren't suitable for their age definitely can have problems later on in life. What do you think we could understand about the media from moral panics, such as violent video games causing violence? If, um, If you're worried about a child playing violent video games, maybe it's up to the, um, the parent to decide up to it's up to the parent i suppose it's like whether they think it's okay for a child to play a game and based off what they see from the media and that it's kind of like like they gotta have to look into it themselves i suppose but yet again the media can exaggerate things so it's up to them to investigate and decide for themselves whether those whether those um things are true or just exaggerated yeah, exactly. And I guess, you know, just to recap or to summarize, how has this podcast helped both of you engage your own personal understanding of moral panics and how they affect the overall media? I, I think just in general, like, it's, you take a step back and you, you ask yourselves these questions and you go, well, what is the media actually feeding us? Like, what is real and what isn't real? And, you know, does this go against stuff that I believe in? Like they, they just pick and choose the information out of a story that they want you to hear and they entice you to read it. And yeah. then y- you get your back up because it's like, well, hang on a second. That's not what it should be. And yeah, exactly. it creates a div- divide in people. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. I think that summarizes up really well as, uh, I think that sums it up in a nice, neat little, uh, basket there for mm. today's podcast but yeah, i want to thank uh you guys coming on to the podcast today it's been a really great experience and i was you know and i'll i always look forward to teaching you guys something new as well <laughs> well well thank you for teaching us jonah it's been really good <laughs> no worries we'll i hope you really there's one thing it, i hope you the audience and also you guys take away from this is that you know you have kind of more of a vivid understanding on how Uh, moral panics can play into reading the media and uh, predicting uh, the media Mm. yeah yeah no worries all right well this summarizes this podcast and i hope you all uh, enjoyed so yeah take care and have a good one